Today we're going to talk about chapter 15 from our book, which is Drawing Conclusions, The Search for the Elusive Bottom Line. And we start by discussing what is internal validity. Um, experiment is internally valid when the effects of the dependent variable are due to the independent variable. So internal validity allows us to make causal statements and experiments are internally valid in principle because we control the antecedent conditions which means that we assign people to their treatment groups. What is a manipulation check? Um, did your experiment uh, manipulate and measure what you thought you were manipulating and measuring? That seems to be a reasonable thing uh, to check. Orrin comes up with his idea of a pact of ignorance, which is uh, people participating, think their data is going to be discarded, and uh, experimenters take the, the people's reports at face value. So this is really a demand characteristic issue. Uh, if we really threw out the data of people who had ascertained the experimental hypothesis, we'd have to toss out about 90% of our undergraduate research because a lot of student research, oh, the vast majority of it, you can see the independent variable coming like a Mack truck. It's obvious what they're manipulating. How do researchers overcome this problem? Well, they debrief the people and ask them if they guess the hypothesis and provide incentives for guessing the hypothesis. I can tell you, uh, in all honesty, I know of no one who does this or who has ever done that. What mistakes could produce a threat to internal validity? Uh, Wrong statistical, wrong, don't give the wrong statistical test. Improperly using a statistical test, wrong. Uh, I guess screwing up the math on it would be wrong too. Drawing the wrong conclusions, wrong. It's right there in the phraseology. What is external validity? Well, if you can extend it to other situations and populations. So can you generalize your results from the lab to the real world? Huge issue in psychological research. What are the true requirements that an externally valid study has to satisfy? Well, it's got to be internally valid. Okay, that's true. Uh, number two, the experimental findings can be replicated. That's true also. I would add a third thing, which is, or a third point to this, which is you have to study something that occurs in the real world. So, for example, most people don't use mnemonics in their daily life, especially people who aren't studying for a test. So, studying mnemonics in the lab has been very low in external validity, literally for centuries, um, since paper became more readily available. What does it mean to generalize across people? Um, so, can we general, extend our conclusions from the college freshmen who volunteer for our study to the rest of humanity? And that's a very good question. That's, a, again, a big issue. Which problems prevent us from generalizing? Well, remember the volunteer problem. Um, people who volunteer are different from people in the rest of the population. So, even... Even college sophomores, the people you're studying, um, you're still studying people who volunteered from that group. So generalizing from procedures to concept. I think the way to think about this is that is anger in an experiment like anger in the real world? And so you can say you're studying something like anger, you can have an operational definition of it, but in the real world people have specific triggers for anger and in the real world, alcohol complicates things um, and makes things more interesting, too. And so is your experiment really taking those kinds of things into consideration? Why is this a problem? It's dangerous to generalize from a single experiment um, to the real world or to, to every other population. So we tend to hedge things in our writing. We send, we, when we write up our results, we say things like, the findings suggest rather than the findings prove, or it appears that, rather than it clearly shows. Um, folks, if you want truth, you have to leave research and go to religion, because that's where people believe they have the truth.
What is research significance? Um, if your findings clarify or extend knowledge gained from previous studies, um, so it's good to find what everyone else finds uh, to be congruent with others. Uh, as they say in history, history repeats itself and historians repeat each other. So it's safest just to add your brick to the edifice of knowledge rather than knocking the edifice down or building a new edifice. It's an easier path. When should we question novel findings? Well, if they contradict prior findings that have been successfully replicated. So if somebody says that they have found that ESP exists or telekinesis or subliminal manipulation, it's actually subliminal. It was President Bush who said subliminal. But if they say that they're able to show that those things exist, the burden of proof is on the experimenter. So why do we want to generalize beyond the laboratory? Well, no one wants to study something that just is what's called a laboratory artifact, uh, meaning something that only occurs in the lab. We want to be able to generalize our results to the real world. What's the problem? Well, fundamentally, the real world is a much messier place than the laboratory. Uh, the reason labs are useful is that they allow us to isolate a behavior of interest. Uh, and control uh, is a huge issue with laboratory research. Uh, control is much higher in labs than in the real world. So the trade-off uh, between laboratories more precise control of extraneous variables and a field experiment's greater realism and external validity. This is true. What did Hansen find? Well, um, I guess if one study finds that, then that's the start of a trend. So that's a positive. When can we extend results from an experiment to everyday life? Um, well, we like to be able to replicate concepts using different research methodologies, and that's what this is talking about. We can be more confident in them when they've been replicated in a number of different ways. So let's talk about aggregation first. Um, this is when you uh, group together an average data to um, increase your external validity. So you combine the results of multiple experiments, which sounds suspiciously like a 1980s version of meta-analysis, which combines um, participants from a number of different studies uh, to, to essentially boost the power. Uh, we've already discussed, discussed meta-analysis. Um, as we said, it's not so much, or as I said, it's not so much garbage in, garbage out, as it is waste management. I'm not a big fan of meta-analysis. How does aggregation establish external validity? Um, basically, if your results hold up over a number of different criteria, they're probably valid. That's what we're getting at with aggregation. What is a multivariate design? Well, multivariate designs study multiple dependent variables. Um, all it really is is adding additional dependent variables to your study. So if you remember our Red Bull versus water study, we can have multiple dependent variables like heart rate and mental acuity. And we can measure heart rate by a chest strap that measures how, how fast your heart's beating. Mental acuity we could test uh, via an anagram task, which is words mixed up. What is the advantage? Well, you can study the effects of independent variable and combinations of dependent variables. Um, it's more efficient to study multiple independent variables, which is a factorial design, and uh, multiple dependent variables, which is a multivariate design. Um, we can just kind of throw them all in and see what pops out. Um, so in our Red Bull experiment, like I said, we can have both a physiological measure, like heart rate, and a cognitive measure, of mental acuity through anagrams. And so we get a more uh, complete picture of um, the impact. How are multivariate experiments analyzed? Well, a multivariate analysis of variance, or MANOVA. That is true, among other tests that you can do, too. Well, here's the downside. How do we handle a non-significant outcome? Um, don't reframe your results as being almost significant. You sometimes see results approached significance 
or he had the means going in the predicted direction. You see that all the time with student research. If that's the case, just run more participants. Uh, the increased power will push you to significance um, statistically. So, uh, you, how do we, what's the checklist? Confounding, that would do it. Uh, extraneous variables that increase within subjects variability. Okay, weak manipulation of the independent variable. Sure, that would do it too. Inconsistent or flawed procedures, you might want to alter those. Ceiling and floor effects. Um, this, I'll explain this a little bit. You want to make sure that your scale accounts for sample variability. So for example, um, a ceiling effect is where everyone is scoring so high that the way you're measuring them doesn't differentiate. So for example, uh, for the ACT, everybody at Harvard has a 36 ACT, or at least a range from 34 to 36 ACT. So it doesn't differentiate between students. That's a ceiling effect. Everyone is so, scoring so high that the test doesn't differentiate between them. You can also have what's called a floor effect, which you could find by having second graders take the MCAT, which is the medical school admissions test. The second graders would all score so low as to make their individual scores meaningless. That's a floor effect. And so you want to avoid ceiling or floor effects. Make sure your scale accounts for the variability that's in your sample. Insufficient power. Um, as I said earlier, the trend is your friend. If the trends are promising, just run more participants and you are likely to get significant results. How do we handle the uh, possibility for a faulty hypothesis? Well, uh, if there's no previous support of our design and the execution were good, you might have to revise or discard your hypothesis. So in other words, move it on down the line or keep on keeping on. You can use whatever um, expression you prefer for that. Uh, but that wraps up chapter 15, and thanks for listening.